what is going on guys welcome back to the channel good to see everybody here today on this last minute uh, pop-up airbus stream here so far so good the internet is holding out really good so i'm extremely happy to see that it's been it's been a rough couple streams lately with the internet woes but i uh, found a small break in my schedule i just came back from i had a trip and then i had to do some recurrent stuff and then i have a day or two off here and then i'm back to work so i found a small window where i could get a, a quick stream in today tomorrow we're also going to stream something kind of secretly juicy uh, courtesy of Carter Jewel. So we're looking forward to that. But what is up, guys? Thank you for joining me here. Last minute, last minute notice. We are going to do a little bit of a kind of a live review. If you haven't seen already, I've done my Thrustmaster full review of the TCA officer pack. I've got that video separate on my channel. Check it out. I'll give you some of my uh, impressions on the, on the hardware so far. Uh, we're going to obviously talk about that live during this flight. And I received so much good feedback from you guys on the last stream when we went over the flows. And if, you're, if you missed the last one, basically what I kind of emphasized on the last stream was when you see me doing stuff here on stream, flipping switches and all that, sometimes it may seem random. But in reality, it's not, right? And, and everything is done by procedure. There's triggers and actions and everything is done systematically. So I took my time to kind of slow down and go over those flow patterns. On this stream, we're going to do the same thing, except I'm not really going to slow it down. I'm just going to, I'm going to get in, I'm going to say I'm doing this flow, and you'll kind of see how it progresses in real time. So if you've been referencing that last stream to kind of see how to get some flow patterns set up, this one, you'll be able to kind of see how it operates in real time. Now, of course, I don't have an FO, so I got to have to kind of do some simisms here and, and do the FO flows as well. But it's going to be a fun stream. We're going to be taking this beautiful 319. I'm on a 319 kick right now. I don't know why. I just can't get enough of the 319. We're going to take the 319 from Salt Lake City, Utah, down to Phoenix Sky Harbor. Golden State, it may or may not. I can neither confirm nor deny RB211s for the Flight Factor 757. All I can tell you is it's absolutely juicy you guys know anything carta puts out is uh is fantastic stuff so that will be tomorrow and so we're looking for that one make sure notifications are on shout out to a couple members here in chat brian rosner what is going on good to see you sam good to see you man hope everything is well hope your training is going good man um hope you're i think you said you were doing your cfi training right so um Send me a DM, man. Let me know how your training is going. I'm curious to see how your progress has been and if you're, if you're still training or not. But uh, glad to see you here as well. Aaron Hastings, Edwin Lee, Anthony Anderson. Good to see you, my friend. Christian, what is going on, man? Always a always pleasure to see you here on stream as well. Vladimir, good to see you. Sergey, uh, uh, man, do. Dubrovnik. I want to. I want to say your last name, but I just don't want to insult you by butchering it. But it, Dubrov, Dubrovnik, Dubrovnik. I don't know. What good to see you here, man. Um, Dougal McTavish. Always a pleasure, my friend. Always, always a pleasure, Dougal, to have you on stream. Steve Venn, Good to see you as well. And of course, Alima, Mad Maxime, Golden State, Aftermath, a couple other guys here. Welcome to the stream, guys. All right. So. Like I said, the last stream I did, I did a real slow methodical flow pattern. Today, we're going to just boom, go boom, boom, boom right through it so you can see how this happens in real time. And we're going to start here, cold and dark, completely cold and dark, right? Remember, when you walk down to the airplane, we're checking for wheel chocks, seeing if the airplane is chocked or not. We want to make sure that the uh, landing gear doors are in the up position. You don't want to see any gear doors hanging down, and you make sure the APU area is clear. Those are the first couple things you check when you're walking down to the aircraft from the jet bridge. Now, of course, when the captain gets to the aircraft, I'm going to check a couple other things in addition to that, such as the aircraft documents, the aircraft tail number, which you know kind of goes unsaid, but in two times in my career have I had an aircraft tail number incident. One time we accidentally boarded up the wrong tail number we actually boarded up the whole airplane it was the wrong tail number i uh, fortunately this hasn't happened to me since i've been a captain but that did happen one time was as a first officer at a regional we boarded up the wrong aircraft and on the airbus as a first officer we were in the wrong airplane wrong tail number but we caught it before boarding so always want to make sure your tail number is the right tail number for the flight i know on the sim world it doesn't make a big difference but in real life you're always swapping tail numbers and stuff so Make sure the flight paperwork, notams, and all that is checked. Okay, so we get to the aircraft, and here is our preliminary flow, guys. I'm not going to go too slow. We're just going to go right through it, right? So first things we're checking. Engine mode, master off, ignition switch in the normal position. Weather radar is off. Come straight up to the overhead. Want to make sure the window wipers are off. You, when you establish power to the aircraft, you don't want those wipers to start going. Checking my battery voltage, 25.6 and greater. We're good to go. So we go battery one, battery two, back online. Here we go. 
From there, we're going to establish electrical AC power with the external power. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. We're going to go through a self-test phase here. While it's doing its self-test, I'm going to brighten up the upper and lower ECAM DUs and the first officer because I'm kind of simulating the first officer doing this flow here. Brighten up his screens and his McDo. Wait for that self-test to complete. Sam says, will do. A lot of good things have happened over the past couple of months, thankfully. Sam, awesome. Good to hear it. All the guys going through training. Good news coming out of the real world, you know, passenger loads here in the airlines is where, you know, my current airline, obviously loads around the country are going up. But even at my current airline, we're actually almost at pre-COVID levels. We're predicted to be pre-COVID levels um, around August, July, August. So that's pretty incredible. I was thinking spring of next year for a full-time recovery, but it's even happening faster than that. So those guys that are in training, it the, the light is at the end of the tunnel. That is for sure. Donation. Donation. <laughs> Sergey, thank you so much for the $5 bomb. He says that is Dubovik. Gotta love Slavic names. Du Dubovik. Am I saying that right? Dubovik. That's awesome, man. Thank you so much, man, for the $5 donation. I appreciate your support here on the channel. Very awesome. Glad to have you on board, man. All right, now that we have power established to the aircraft, we're going to continue with our flow. We're going to go ahead and do the APU fire test. Check it for our lights, squib, CRC. Then we're going to come down here. We're not going to use the APU right now. Check the aircraft lighting. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess I'll leave that on for now. right now. Air conditioning panel is uh, pretty much normal there. From there, we're going to drop down to the lower ECAM. We're checking the oxygen pressure. And there we check our oil quartz. We're in a CEO variant of IA engine, so we need 11 uh, quartz plus 0.3 per hour burn for the flight. We've got plenty of oil. I would actually be a little bit concerned if I saw 22 in there. Um, let's see, coming over to the hydraulics, make sure they are fully serviced. That looks good. And then, of course, press and hold the recall push button. Nothing pops up there on the ECAM for any cleared failures. From there, we'll go ahead and make sure the flaps are up. Sported brakes are retracted. Parking brake is on. And circuit breakers. From there, FO is going outside. Myself, the captain, I walk down to the aircraft. Here we go, we're gonna go through the captain's flow. Sit in my chair, overhead starts on the overhead. Here we go, up the overhead, ground supply. That comes on, our crew supply oxygen comes on. Ground control push button, CVR test. We'll execute the CVR test. From there, moving up the panel, captain purser to captain only. Eight ears, one. And in real life, we do wait for the on battery light to illuminate and then extinguish. Oh. Two, hopefully I didn't mess that up, go to attitude mode there. And then three. Now the reason that we wait for that on battery light, make sure that the eight ears do have the ability to revert, revert to a battery power. One, two, three, that looks good. Then we're gonna go here from the left to right up the middle panel. Position one, seat belts off, off, we're not done fueling, we'll arm those. Pressurization is in the auto position. Pack flow, I don't know how many people we have, but let's go high pack flow today. I think we're going to fully load this airplane up. That looks good. Everything else looks good here. Electrical, we're going to do our electrical battery test. Pop that up. Battery one, two, off. B seals back on. Make sure we have 60 amps or less decreasing within 10 seconds or less. Fuel tank pumps, we'll leave those off for fueling, and we'll do our fire test. Again, we're looking for both squib lights, discharge lights, fire lights, CRC, master warning, ECAM fire, and of course the engine fire on the uh, by the ignition switch down there on the center pedestal. Up the right-hand side, making sure everything is all white lights out configuration here. Turn on the third RMP, make sure that is out and on. Audio switching in a normal position all the way up to the maintenance panel, making sure the all lights are out here in the maintenance panel. Of course, we would check the cockpit door, striker test and all that, but again, I don't really discuss cockpit door operation here on a stream. From there, I'm sitting down. I come back to the lower center here. We're going to go, ISIS is checked. Clear that electric page off there. ISIS is checked. Time and date is correct. Nose wheel steering is on. Center pedestal. Turn up my brightness. Turn on my radio panel. Make sure it's set how I want it. Configure the radar. Make sure it's pretty much all off. Put those in auto right now. But make sure that is off. Switching panel, normal. Thrust levers idle. Off, off, normal. Parking brake is set. Gear extension is stowed. And the dogs are barking. From there, I'll make sure the TCAS is set. That pretty much concludes that part of my flow. At this time, Phantom 320 has come back to the aircraft. 
so I can continue my flow. I'm going to start at the FCU. FDs, we're going to keep them off here at the gate right now. FDs off. Current altimeter is 3017. Now this sets all three of them, so we don't have to set them individually. 3017, set them, put constraint modes on, down to 10 mile range. That looks good for now. Now I'm going to check my oxygen. That looks good. Now I get my PFD and ND brightness. We're almost done. Make sure the loudspeaker is set after doing that cockpit voice uh, recorder test. From there, I'm going to check the ECAM. Checking again, make sure we're in auto pressurization here. Kind of an interesting little uh, glitch there we got going on. Of course, the status page. That looks good. And now we will load the box. So there you have it. There is your preliminary flow and your captain flow basically setting up the aircraft from cold in dark. So kind of ignored you guys in chat. Let's get back to some of the questions here. How far into the pre-flight did you guys get when you realized you was the wrong tail number? Golden State, so the first time it happened, uh, I'll tell us, remind me to tell the full story when we're in cruise, but no, we boarded. We were, um, I think it was a, it was a clearance or I don't know how we caught it. I think it was a seating configuration issue because it was on the Embraer 170 and we, we realized their seating didn't match. Um, and the other instance, we were pretty much at this point in the pre-flight right now. So uh, after everything has been completed, we were kind of sitting there and I think it was a PDC that came through or something and then I saw the tail number didn't match. I'm like, holy crap, dude, we're in the wrong airplane. Um, yeah, but yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you the, I'll tell you how it can sneak up on you here when we get up into cruise. But right now, let's go ahead and do our diffs writ. <laughs> Almost correct, Sergey. <laughs> I'm trying, man. Golden State has been quite a few times. And you accidentally put the Adaru in, uh, in attitude mode. It's all good, man. All right, here we go. Salt Lake City. Let's get our flight plan out here. Initialize. We are going, I'm just going to type this out because it's always a little bit easier. KSLC to KPHX, America's friendliest airport. We are operating as America West, AKA Cactus 357, cost index 75. Cruise flight level for us is 370. Oh, I think I just extended the flaps to position three or I don't know what I did there. So didn't like that. 370. Here we go. Actual temp aloft, minus 52. Let's throw that in there. Tropopause. I get this question sometimes. 49.4. We'll put 49.400 in there. Uh, I think Tolos wants it in equal numbers. That shouldn't be out of range. Uh, all right, we'll just leave it. Basically, you'd put the tropo in there. Above the tropopause, the temperature aloft begins to increase. So that's why you put that in there for perf, perf numbers. Aftermath says, uh, hey, Captain, what do you do when the gear doors are down on the ground? How do you get them up? Uh, you call, Do you call maintenance or get the aircraft? How does that work out? So, yeah, if the gear doors are down, something is wrong. Typically, it's going to be because maintenance has lowered the gear doors for something down there that they're working on. Hence why you don't want, if that's the case, you don't touch anything in the cockpit, especially hydraulic wise when you get down there because you don't want to close or pressurize any system and then close a ramp or, or a, a maintenance technician inside the, the gear door there. So that's why it's extremely important. It's happened before, been some, some serious accidents about that. Um, but yes, if they were down, you would make sure maintenance knows and you'd go through a procedure to close it. You could pressurize the aircraft completely hydraulic wise on the ground with that maintenance panel. So. All right, initialization is done. What do we got for a route here? We're going to be departing off of SLC. Give me a 10-9 page here. Can you please show your sound slider settings? Mr. Martin Torres, Sound 3D. This is, uh, here you go if you want to take a look at it. Basically, everything everything's 100, my friend. Everything's 100, just about. On BSS. Airport 10.9. Oop, that's 10.9B. I don't want that. 10.9. Here we go. This is not on VATSIM. I, I just, I feel like my internet is struggling with VATSIM. So, 3, 4, I've already seen a couple drop frames, but. Uh, charts. And I feel like I could discuss more with you guys when I'm not on VATSIM. Why don't I have the Zions 1?
Is it off 1.6s? It is. All right, I guess we're going to 1.6. Zion 1, Bryce Canyon, insert that. Scroll it down here. From Bryce Canyon, we're going to Corker. I have to check the winds, make sure indeed we are launching southbound. C-O-R-K-K, -K oh, C-O-R-K-R. -K Set, tents. I don't know what it is. I still feel like I have a hard time clicking this box. Tents, insert, Phoenix, Bruiser 1. Hopefully we'll get runway 8. Bruiser 1, Novia. Tense, insert, done. Oh, oh, Gustavo says the trop is uh, limited in the total to 44.9. All right. I won't be able to get up there anyway, so not a big deal. Do a quick secondary, initialize. We're going to do SLC to SLC. Secondary again. I do have failures with Tolis, so we got to make sure we are set up here. One six left to return. Insert that. Secondary perf. Of course, real airplane, look up your actual numbers. I'm just putting 200 in the DH. Zero for zero on the wind. I don't want any additional performance on my calculation. Temperature outside is warming up already. Two, three degrees here in the high desert. QNH 3017. That way, if we have to return, we just pop that secondary ready to go. Nothing in the rad nav. Init B. Let's go ahead and load up our aircraft. Or does it have a pa I know it has a passenger load on here somewhere, doesn't it? I'm just curious what Simbrief gave us. Maybe not. It just gives us that zero fuel load. Anyway. All right. So we need 11,000 gate fuel. So here we go. Loading. We're going to take a full load. 145. We'll put about 2,000 in the cargo. 11, 8 on board, quick refuel and apply those load settings. That gives us 123. It's going to be interesting when we get down. We're going to talk about some high density altitude operations here for sure. 123.9 and 30.1 on the CG. Block fuel 11.8. Depending on who you work for, if you're block fuel, if you get overfueled or underfueled by a couple hundred pounds, you may have to get an amendment. Uh, 300 pounds for us, so we may have to get an amendment for that. Anyways, that looks good. We got 44 minutes extra gas, no alternate. Oh, Mr. Martin, the sound tab, if you run BSS, you want to make sure you turn all of your TOLA sounds off. So there you go. Everything off except the oral alerts. And loading perf, since I'm here now, oh, you know what? Let's just let's try to keep it simulation here a little bit more realistic. We'll leave our perf data blank. That's all set up. All right, from there we've completed our diffs rip. And our fueling is complete, correct? 11.8, so then I'll come here. That's a trigger for me, right? We talked about flows. Fueling's complete. Ecam the memo is gone. Make sure it is balanced. Proper fuel load. Yes, it is. From there, we'll go ahead and turn on our fuel tank pumps. And we'll go ahead and turn on the seat belts. And then from there, we're going to go ahead and uh, they'll pr probably start hearing some doors closing up. We'll start closing these. We'll close everything except the 1L door there. Get a look here at these juicy engines. Might have to turn down the internal sounds here. Doors are closing up. Edwin, have to sign off now. Dinner's ready. Catch you later. Take it easy, Edwin. Oh, it tells you in Simbrief what runway is planned? I didn't even know that. In the top right. I believe you. I don't want to waste time looking for it. All right, so we're loading up here. Doors are starting to close up. We can see the hydraulic pressure. See the PT? Well, in real life, you can see that PTU running because they're running that hand pump down there. That's how you know the doors are getting closed up. All right, so let's do a brief now, and then we'll go from there. Let's take a look at our departure, Zion's departure procedure, a Zion 1 RNAV. Is this standard for the FO to go into the cockpit first before the captain enters the cockpit? Brian V, I wouldn't say standard. It's kind of just whoever gets there first. Now, if you're arriving as a crew, which unless you're reporting in base for a trip, you're probably always going to arrive as a crew, right? So it's more of a, 
a pilot monitoring, Airbus defines it as a pilot monitoring flow and a pilot flying flow. Now, traditionally in the United States, the captain is always the pilot flying on the ground. So the pilot monitoring preliminary flow is typically going to be delegated to the first officer because in the U.S. on the ground, the captain is technically pilot flying always, even if it's the first officer's leg to fly the airplane. So, you know, even though he's going to be taking the controls from takeoff to landing, after that transfer controls, captain becomes pilot flying on the ground. So all those flows that Airbus dictates as pilot monitoring before you actually lift off or, or take off, I should say, that would traditionally be done by the first officer. Not to say that, you know, the captain can't do it. If I show up early, sometimes I'm early, I'll just check it out. I'll do it. I'll do it all right. Get it set up. There's nothing saying I can't do it. All right, Zions 1, here you go. You ready for departure brief? We're going to be departing the Zions 1 RNAV departure today. We're planning on going off runway 16 left for departure. 12,000 foot runway. Uh, let's see, Zions off 16 left. We're going to be up to flight level 230. We'll go ahead and throw that in the box. If we have emergencies on the takeoff roll, engine fire failure prior to B1, it'd be my decision to reject, bring the aircraft to complete stop, set the parking brake, call flight attendant stations, analyze the situation, perform any ECAM actions or the emergency evacuation checklist as required. You will do, and the first officer will do his spiel. Other than that, we'll treat it as an in-flight emergency. If we have to come back around, we're going to land on runway 16 left, long drive runway here. Don't even need the ILS. we got it programmed in the box. Should we need to do an air return? Uh, probably be a little bit overweight for landing if we do come back. Other than that, we'll continue everything else uh, in flight out to our transition to Bryce Canyon. We're going to start one engine here, taxi out. Got any questions? No questions. It's kind of a, a poor brief, but that's what I got for you guys here today. So that is set, and 10 minutes prior to departure, I'm going to go ahead and get the APU fired up, and then we're going to do a checklist. Yeah, Dougal says, I didn't know about pilot flying on the ground. Yeah, so Airbus kind of, if you look at the Airbus, the way they do it, it's it's delegated pilot flying, pilot monitoring. And I don't know, maybe some of you European guys uh, will be able to tell me. Uh, I don't know if it's the same in Europe or in other countries where if it's the first officer leg to fly, if the captain still is technically pilot flying on the ground. That's pretty standard, you know, here in the U.S. Unless you're flying a 135 operation or, you know, corporate jets, then... It's a little bit different, but traditionally speaking, 121 ops, that's how it goes. All right, let's do a before start checklist to the line. Maintenance log and tail number, it's on board and check. Remember, we checked that in the checklist. Boom. I think that's when we caught it <laughs> the second time was right here at this checklist. Cockpit prep has been complete. Gear pins and covers removed. Signs are on and auto. Eight ears, nav, fuel. 11 one required, 11 eight on board. Altimeters, 3017 set, EFB check, four-star checklist to the line. And one thing we got to make sure is we turn off the low-pressure air before activating the APU bleed. We got power. We'll go ahead and disconnect from you. Pull the ground power, sir. That has been pulled. And I think we're going to have a door closing here. We'll close you. We'll get the pushback out to the aircraft here. Hey, Captain, let me know where you want this thing. We're going to go out like that. Great news, Captain. Your toe's coming. And let me go ahead and hide them now. All right. I got 100 here. I'm going to clear out my FCUs. I don't know why that should give me dashes. Oh, you know what? For speeds. One thing we forgot to do. 1 plus F, toga thrust. 34, 34, 38. Flaps one. Flaps one packs off. We'll leave the uh, leave the APU running on this one. Christian says I've seen some videos that most of the airlines the crew meets in a crew and before the flight and order the fuel go over the flight plan etc. I guess that's not how U.S. airlines All operate. Right. Looks like the doors and hatches are closed and we're ready to connect. Um, 
Christian, I wouldn't say all. I guess it would kind of depend on, on who you work for. And I can imagine the long haul guys, if you're doing some, some super long haul transcon stuff, you'd probably have more of a traditional briefing. The traditional crew briefing that you're, you're thinking of, I do it on the aircraft. You show up because we have a report time where you're supposed to meet at the aircraft and everybody checks in online. So once you're checked in, no one's really looking for you. And everybody's at the aircraft. I'll brief the flight attendants, first officer, get all that done. And then, of course, yeah, while I'm here answering questions on YouTube, in reality, I would be discussing weather with the first officer, discussing notums, anything pertinent to the flight, and we're going to roll from there. So, Welcome aboard, Captain. Toes connected. Bypass pens inserted. Go ahead and kill the parking brake when you're ready to go. All right, so for my trigger for f to finish up this flow and get us off the gate, I'm looking for this T, or I'm sorry, TCAS, this nose wheel steering, a disconnect pin. That is in there, right? So from now, I'm going to go ahead and finish my flow. I'm going to go beacon on. I'm going to make sure the nose wheel steering is on. Doors are closed and armed. Verify. Accumulator pressure is in the green. Thrust levers are idle. Brake is on for now. Doors normal. Windows closed. Let's do a before start checklist below the line, sir. Below the line, windows, doors, and slides. They are closed and armed. Beacon is on. Thrust levers idle. Parking brake is off. Transponder is we'll throw that in transponder mode that's an fo thing should have done that right there boom all right let's do it brakes released clear to push sir quasimodo said trim Light them up. what do we got down point two we'll throw a down point two in there so big shouldn't hurt us too much is it necessary to input trim as second entry after takeoff flaps on the talk, Nikki, are you talking about on the McDo? So in the Neo, in the 321 Neo, depending on the software, yes, you will need to input that or else it'll trigger a ECAM mismatch fault going down the runway. But on not a Neo, no, it is not required. It doesn't do anything for you. Now, some airline SOPs may require it, but it's not going to, it doesn't auto set. I believe the wide body Airbus 350 as well will also auto set trim after engine start. Fubar, what is going on, man? Welcome. Just saw a stream was happening. Yeah, a little last minute stream. I appreciate you joining. Got 143 people watching, only 72 likes. Let's bump it up for a last minute, last minute stream, huh? Let's bump those. Let's bump those numbers up. Those are rookie numbers on that like button there. I love that you can hear the APU light off. Me too, man. Gosh, I love that IE motor down there. This is a pretty cool livery, too. Yep, Nikki. Yeah, you don't have to... On the 319, you don't really have to worry about it. I know Tolis has it implemented on that 321 Neo. I actually saw it on the, one of the streams we did. I actually went rolling down the runway. We got that message. James says, after a frustrating week, it's time for a GNT and V1. James Monks. Right there with you, my friend. I'm right there with you. It's been a long week for me, man. It's been a long week. Been flying and studying, doing all kinds of stuff. My brain is slowly, slowly getting fried here. Just about done here. Go ahead and set your parking brake. I think that's a parking brake. And we're disconnecting the tow. Give me just a moment. Roger that. All right, we're going to go ahead and start them up. Okay, so we get to talk about the thrust lever quadrant. I don't really talk about it, but I will say it's kind of fun doing this. So we're going to go engine mode to ignition start, and we're going to flip over engine one. Here we go. Enjoy the startup, guys. Doogle, doogle, doogle. Celebrating today, MRI results in full remission. Doogle. And we're disconnected. Signal and pen on the left. Take it easy and have a safe flight. Roger that. Thanks for a smooth push, man. We'll see you next time. Doogle, thank you so... I mean, thank you. That is... I am so thankful for you, man. That is that is incredible news. That is absolutely awesome. I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. Guys, positive. If you're a member, positive rates in chat for Doogle McTavish. 
has results in with full remission today. He's been in and out of the chat. He's been dealing with a lot of medical, and it's just, you know, he's been a diehard supporter of, of a ton of content creators on YouTube and just a phenomenal I've never met him in person, but just from my interactions with him, he's a phenomenal gentleman and, uh, you know, spearheaded the whole Sim Wings campaign, get that thing rolling. So, Dougal, that is awesome, awesome news, my friend. That awesome news. We're going to get some full yogas going here for you for celebrating full remission as well. That's fantastic, Dougal. I'm so happy to hear that, man. All right, good start here on one. So, I'm going to move my selector back down. And we're going to arm the speed brakes. We're going to go flaps to position one. The yellow electric pump is on. We're going to leave the APU bleed on because it's hot AF. And after start checklist. Notice what steering is gone. So that's my cue for the after start checklist. Engine anti-ice is not required. Put my intercom to intercom. And then the first officer will run the after start. Engine anti-ice is off. Yellow electric pump is off. Rudder trim zero. After start checklist is complete. Okay, let's go ahead and release the brakes. Tolus is going to do its Tolus thing. We're going to turn on the taxi light and we're going to do a cinematic, cinematic drive out here. So I will say, if you guys have probably have watched that review by now, if you're watching this stream, about the Thrustmaster Quadrant. So I pointed out that one of my biggest pet peeves is the, the distance between idle to the climb detent. Now the re, the, what makes this really challenging is, is ground ops amongst other things. But ground ops, you see how much distance there actually is? This is a pretty much accurate representation of how it should be in real life. The quadrant itself is equidistant from idle to climb, climb to MCT. So you have a, that very, very small window to operate. And I mean, I just move the thrust lever, I mean, a quarter of an inch and I get 50% thrust. Where in reality, a 50% thrust on the ground, single engine is about one throttle's width above the other. So like I'll show you here if you follow that throttle quadrant. So right about there, in reality, that's that's correct. I'm getting about what almost 40% N1 there. So if I went one full length, yeah, that's 40% N1. That's accurate. But on my actual hardware, I'm only moving it about a half inch. So it can make taxiing very challenging if you're not used to that. But that's other than that. I mean, I will say it is fun. It is very fun to be able to grab an actual Airbus throttle quadrant here and and taxi the airplane on the ground. I, I mean, I've, I've got my res you know reservations on this whole setup, but I cannot deny that it's it is pretty fun. It is pretty fun. So we're number one for takeoff. Let's go ahead and start engine two. Yellow electric pump is off. APU bleed is on. Ignition switch to uh, number two. And I'm going to just move my start switch to the number two position. Let's spool them up. Thought we had a hung start there. Took a while to spool up. Aaron Hastings says, "How well are your thrust levers synced?" Um, you know, let me let me check. Right, I mean, I haven't noticed any significant uh, desync, Aaron, yet. I think I saw a couple guys talking on the forums about that, but luckily I, I have not had that issue yet. So. All right, I'll move my ignition switch to back to norm. Don't need engine anti-ice. We're going to leave the APU bleed on for this departure. So 
So this would be a, a PAX off takeoff with the APU bleed. All right. Let's do another FSR checklist. Engine ass off. Felix Pumps off. Red trims your FSR checklist complete. All right. There's my cue. Here we go. Flight controls. Full up, full down, a neutral. Full left. Full right, a neutral. Rudder, full left, full right. Neutral, I know it's not full position because of my detents there. First officer will do his flows and then he comes over and he actually does this whole flow right here. He's gonna turn on system one, system two, auto, T-A-R-A, -A, make a P-A, and then I'm gonna hit this here just cause that's how we notify him on Dolus. And now, after that P-A, flight attendants prepare for takeoff. There's another trigger for me. Let's do a before takeoff checklist. Gross weight comparison is complete. Pitch trim 0.3% CG set. V1, VR, a V2 flex. Off the McDo, 134, 134, 138, no flex set. Flaps, config 1 plus F. Fuel on board, 11, 1 required, 11, 6 on board. 11, 11 1 required, 11, 6 on board. Flight controls check, ECAM memo, take a fall green, ECAM status check, PWS on, TCAS code set, TRE, CAM crew advised, mini brief is complete, and then below the line, take off runway, I got 1-6 left confirmed, fuel, 11-1 required, 11-6 on board, engine mode selector, normal, bleeds and packs are set before takeoff, checklist is complete, Cactus 357, 1-6 left, line up and wait, 1-6 left, line up and wait, Cactus 357, finals clear, verify out in the window, also verify your TCAS, and here we go, line it up. Why do you need to wait three minutes after uh, engine start? It doesn't matter if you're toga or using flex, and it's it's for engine warm up, man. It's just engine warm up. You don't want to be demanding a high power, cold engine. It's just a good way to break something with any engine, really. Car, boat, doesn't really matter. Airplane. All right. Greg Hill, good morning. Welcome. Gravy says, I'm not sure if you've answered this, but how often do you taxi, single engine taxi? Quite a bit, man. In the U.S., it's a pretty common procedure. So, Are you guys ready for maximum yogas in chat? Here we go. We're doing a PAX off takeoff. This time we're going to run it with the APU bleed on. So APU has precedence over the cabin environmentals. So we're not taking any demand from the engine. So we're going to get a pretty loud, pretty loud yoga sound. Make sure that is set. Get my views set up here. Nose forward on the stick. And I love doing this with the Airbus TCA quadrant. Here we go. You ready? Spool them up 50%. Here we go. Maximum yoga. Gotta love it. All right. Back on center line. We're all over the place here. 80 knots, thrust set. Wow, I'm all over the runway, I apologize. Neutralize that forward pressure by 100 knots. This is that muscle memory, I love doing this here. V1, hand removed from the thrust levers. Rotate, up we go. Positive rate, gear up. Fly by. That is maximum juice right there. Gotta love it. Oh man, this marker beacon. Lever climb, here we go. Thrust climb, auto thrust. Love that reduction. Did you hear that reduction? That was awesome. This is where we blew an engine on the 73200 last year. Man, I love the Airbus. Let's go ahead and stop climbing out at V2 here, start cleaning things up. All right, we're at acceleration altitude. At that point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the APU bleed, and I'm also going to shut down the APU at this point. It is no longer required. 
Cactus 357. Proceed direct to Loudy. Climb and maintain fly level 370. Climb and maintain fly level 370 direct to Loudy, Cactus 357. All right, thrust climb, open climb, nav, autopilot one engaged. Approaching S speed, we will retract. Look at this. I'm actually going to come back one seat. Oh, nope, 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 nope. Right here. Retraction. Max Rank, what is up, man? Welcome. He says, I missed the departure. I'll catch the next one, next flight. No worries, Max. This is a last minute stream here. Found some time in my day, and I, I wanted to. I don't know, I just wanted to get back to you guys. It's been a week. I'm, I'm struggling to get one to two videos out a week right now, so internet was behaving, and I said, man, I would love to do a stream, hang out with you guys, so welcome. Christian says, on landing, to do manual thrust to actually see if the asymmetry is bad. On Oh, on manual... Oh, you want me to do manual thrust on landing. Okay, Christian, we'll do it. So on landing, I will go auto thrust off, and we'll see what the what the thrust is like. That's going to be a little sketch because, again, I hate moving into that climb detent, but you're right. Let's go ahead and give it a, a, a try. If I'm forgetting, remind me. Just spam the chat or something. You, you could spam that in the chat next time so I can... I'll do it. This is Salt Lake City Departure. Look at that. Mountains in the background right there. Do you find the colors on the Tolos PFD are a bit off? I've been trying to tweak them, but it's a rather daft process with the way Tolos structures the files. You know, I don't know if it's the colors. They used to be really off. Uh, like I felt they were pretty off, but I thought it was more because they were trying to simulate, oh, we should have terrain on ND. There's 11,000 feet as well. Let's go ahead and get our, uh, you know what? We never turned our lights on, but all right, lights are off. Wing lights can come off. Ding the flight attendants. Let them know we're at a 10,000. And... To help with the climb, I'm going to do uh, 310 in the climb out here, just to kind of help us get out of here. And that looks better. Outside air temp 22C, so we definitely don't need that. How much power you gain by leaving the landing lights off? Quasimodo, I didn't mean to leave them off, man. That was my mistake. I got too excited. On the takeoff clearance, they'd all come on. That's, that's on me. Um, but yes, Maxim, I don't know if it's the colors or the font. It, to me, it reminds me of an EIS-1 like screen. Uh, they've gotten, they've definitely gotten better. They've tweaked some of the, the pinks, I think, and the ambers. It's definitely better. It's definitely better than what it used to be, but I, I can't... I would agree with you in the fact that it's a, something is off, but I just can't put my finger on it. Do I have Starlink now, sir? The stream doesn't lag at all. No, Harmony. As a matter of fact, I don't have Starlink yet. Still waiting on it, but it's just the luck of the draw, man. Some days the internet is good, some days it's bad, and we just got to work with it here. But I'm still waiting on the Starlink, man. You tell the FO how great the engine noises are in real life, dude. I do, man. I do. I, uh, matter of fact, I was flying with a guy, and I was like, hey, man, you know, I... You're going to be on vacation after this flight. I won't feel bad if you use Toga Thrust. You know, it's the last takeoff for a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> full-blown Toga, here we go. There's nothing wrong with using Toga. If, you know, it's, if anything, it's going to be a little bit more... You get more margin for obstacle clearance and all that stuff. So, plus it was raining. And, you know, th there's kind of a gray line there. It says on contaminated runways... And you're pooling water. So if you're taking off on a grooved runway that's wet, but it's just kind of misting out, do you flex or do you toga? And it's, it depends on how you read the line in the book. And most of the time, I'll just toga it to be safe because you always got to look at how will that make you look if you know something happens and you look at the accident report and the FAA is questioning you. It says, well, it says here if the runway is raining, if it's raining out, you should use toga thrust. And why'd you flex? Well, it was drizzling. It wasn't really raining, so that's kind of a bad excuse. So, CYA, man, always got to cover your butt. Adam C says, I found there is a little, there is a very little throttle desync. It's only noticeable when taxiing or landing. Huh.
I have Shade X, but don't know why airplane looks off. Vikas, thank you for the rupee donation. I appreciate it. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of just waiting now for the lighting, whole lighting change to come. I mean, X plane, I think is going to be an absolute. I think it's going to be a game changer. That video where they purposely leaked or they showed the what the new lighting is going to look like, the lighting system coming to X plane. So. I'm holding off on all shader mods, all X Enviro, everything. I'm pretty much running. This is stock X Plane that you guys are looking at right now. Stock weather, stock clouds, everything is default. And I'm just going to run that way until we see what X Plane comes out with. Because of what they showed on that on that video is going to be absolutely awesome. Hope your power doesn't go out with the power company asking everyone to text to conserve power. <laughs> Brian V, I, I am uh, out on a... I'm pretty far out on a little grid that hopefully I don't think it's going to affect us. But yeah, it's it's wild, man. FS Turt says, hey, Captain, I see lots of flights on flight radar. It looks like we're back to normal. Are they mostly cargo or passenger? Turt, I talked about this a little while ago. Um, depending on which airline you're at, in the U.S., most of us are pretty much coming up to pre-COVID levels here during the end of summer and into August. So I was doing some recurrent stuff and I was talking to some higher ups, I should say. And essentially, yeah, our, our, uh, our passenger loads and our daily flights are pretty much getting up to that pre-COVID level. Now, I, my early prediction was I said spring of 2022 when we should be pre-COVID again, but it's, it seems to be happening faster than that. There are, the airports are busy, the airplanes are getting more full so I, I jump seated home on a 737-800 last night. It was completely full. So it's uh, it's coming back, man. Scott, what's up, man? It says, V1, I'm at a doctor appointment. Can't watch the live. This is totally depressing me. Have a good flight. I'll watch later. Scott, no worries, man. Got to gotta love a good dentist appointment. All right, how are we doing here in the climb out? We're at way past 18, our standard is set. We did have that restriction loud at or above 14, but that's not an issue with us. What is our uh, managed climb speed? I'm gonna go ahead and turn terrain off now. We'll look here at our perf. Managed climbs got us going out at 317.77. I'll go ahead and manage it back up. Pick up the speed a little bit. Secondary will copy the active. Now this should have been done out of 10,000 feet by the pilot monitoring. 24.5, it's been a smooth ride. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the seatbelt sign off. Let them roam. And now we just sit back, relax. This is how we like to be. This is what we call fat, dumb, and happy right here. Nothing going on. Don't have to think. And airplane is doing all things airplane thing. And let's turn down the volume, go outside here. Let's drop this down to about 30%. And that's still loud. Well, hopefully, hopefully I didn't blow out too many of your ears there. That's a cool shot though. There we go. V1 on a 7.3. Christian, dude, I tell you what, man. I would rather sit on an Airbus seven days a week and twice on Sunday, man. I don't know. I think, of course, it has to do with the passenger configuration of any airline. Man, that 7.3 I was on last night, that was miserable. You're sitting in the back. You're yawning around and just, ugh. Man, I missed my Airbus. Definitely missed my Airbus, man. Adam C says, one tip I have to reduce throttle desync is not connect them with the screwdriver rod that comes in the box. Oh, so I, they actually connect? I didn't even know that. So I have my thrust levers f free to move independently. That's how they are in the real airplane. You, know, you can move them independently. I think, I think there is... Yeah, there's no magnet or there's no force really holding them together. They move independently in the airplane as well. But, of course, the friction. I know a lot of guys warn me about the friction not to over-tighten. So, again, that's why we're I, – I left it pretty much what it came out of the box. I, I tightened it up just a little bit. If 
Fauna West is my 19, 319 has very high V speeds. I don't think you're doing anything wrong, uh, Fauna Are you flexing? What's your flex number? Are you getting better performance now because everything is stock? Jeremy, um, probably. I'm rocking 77 FPS right now. So definitely, X Enviro definitely hurts the performance 100%. I mean, that's, you'll knock out 50% of your frames with X Enviro. I work for a fueling company at Denver, and we are noticing that customers that I fuel are only about 10 to 15 flights shorter than what we were pre-COVID. Wow. That's good, Zach. That's good news, man. That's all in good news. Gustavo, I just saw your question up there. I'm kind of scrolling back. Is, this, is my operator requesting you guys to be vaccinated? So far, no. Uh, I know there's a couple different airlines that are requiring new hires to get, the, get a vaccine. But that's a touchy subject, man. That's a very touchy subject. We'll see how that works out. Fauna, well, there you go. 70 degree, 70 degree flex. That's about as high as it'll go. I, is it 72? or I thought it was like 69. I know there is a max flex limit. I should know this. I should know this on the 319. Maybe 72 is max. But that's up, that's up close to max flex, Fanawa. That's why your V-speeds are so high. Ah, so there is a pin that you can link them together. Oh, they, okay, Christian. I appreciate I got it. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I've got it. I've got all the hardware stuff that came with it over in the box still. But overall, I mean, you know, that review that I put out, if you guys haven't watched it, I suggest watching it just because it's, it really is just an honest opinion. And I point out, mostly the deficiencies in what I saw and why I held out on, on getting thrust this Thrustmaster set up for so long. But again, when I was doing so much X-Plane, I was streaming, we streamed a lot last year when I had my, my gigabit internet the setup for the Airbus on my X-Plane sim. Then I can review it, and then of course, it won't do any negative training, right? So if you're doing something the opposite of what you're supposed to be doing, it's just called negative training. And over time, you can develop negative muscle memory patterns or you can have a regression in your original muscle memory pattern so i know muscle memory is a, is a big thing for military guys when they're talking about uh, flying jets and stuff but uh oh we had an internet flicker there now looking at the stick well look at the stick a little bit um, I wish I know why they put that hat switch on the top, but if you look at the real Airbus side stick here, so we'll come into the cockpit and you can see, so this is probably why it doesn't feel hundred percent right. Um, it's close, but this little indentation, I'll see if I can zoom way in on it here. This is where I rest my thumb pretty much the majority of the time. Now, if I'm shadowing the controls or something, I'm going to kind of rest my thumb over or near the takeover push button stick coming in for landing any critical phase of flight you always want to be shadowing the controls just in case you need to right whether the pilot flying makes a mistake or maybe as a side stick fault you never know it's always good practice to be in position in a critical phase of flight to to take over the aircraft but generally i'm gonna have my thumb here and on the warthog on the warthog on the thrustmaster airbus stick they got that hat switch right here in the middle so it kind of makes a weird <laughs> feeling for my hand but you know, I knew that going into it, and I know that why they did that, because if you are buying the setup, it's going to be, I wouldn't say it's hard, it's its optimum, obviously, for the Airbus. So when you try to fly other airplanes, it's you need to have some additional functionality, so I understand why Thrustmaster went ahead. They also give you an extra button on the front of the trigger and on the side, so I understand that, but the stick itself, I think... It, it makes the airplane harder to hand fly. Right now, I don't have any curve set up. We're gonna just we're gonna rock that because I'm I kind of like how it felt initially. So I've got absolutely zero curve or zero stabilities on the joystick pitch and roll axis. We're just running with it straight out of the box, 100% linear. 
but that spring is so heavy in there, it's, it almost wants to fight you. So if you go up and you try to do some maneuvers, whether it be steep turns or you want to do stalling configurations or even just hand flying a, a single engine ILS, even just hand flying an ILS in general, if you have to make larger than normal corrections, it's harder to maintain that position with the joystick because that spring is really fighting to come back to center. And the real Airbus side stick does return to center, but it returns to center very slow. It's, you let go, it just kind of, just kind of, I don't know, how do I explain it? It just kind of rolls back to center. This one will snap back pretty hard. So, but I mean, of course, you know, it's a couple hundred bucks as opposed to I don't even know how much an Airbus side stick costs. I guarantee you, it's that's up there, probably ten grand. You, you take that whole box out. I've seen what the side stick actually is is comprised of. That whole component there by the pedestal is just pretty incredible. What goes on inside there? So, lots of money in the real airplane versus you know something you got to have here on your desk. But with all the kind of the constructive criticisms, if I may, on the peripherals Thrustmaster, I still enjoy using it. I am, I'm not dissatisfied and I enjoy, I enjoy using it. And taxing, honestly, is a lot of fun now because I feel like, okay, yeah, I'm actually taxing a real airplane. I got my, got the right hand on the throttles and I got the right tactile feel of the thrust levers. So I'm, I'm happy with it, honestly. Yeah, Sam, he took that hat switch off. I'm probably going to do that myself. I think there's a way to lock out the detents if you're assuming. Yes, Chris, and there is. There is. So you can get rid of all the detents. But what fun is that, right? I want to keep the detents. So the detents are fun. I love it. I just wish, if anything, if anything, if they couldn't have made the throw just a little bit longer, what they should have done is just made the detents, if you have to make them equal, make the detent between climb and toga equal so i mean which is not realistic because the only one that's short would be from mct to toga but if you were to you know, let me just show you on the, air, the throttle quadrant here easier to explain because this is actually a, a good representation so what they did is they moved this climb detent pretty much right smack dab in the middle here if anything, I wish they would have moved this closer so you'd have just two small detents up here, which wouldn't be 100% realistic because there is a thrust range available between climb thrust and MCT. But I would rather sacrifice that small range if it was equal to just this step here and have more range here, but it is what it is. That's the only drawback is you have a very small window to operate with the auto thrust off with the standard detents. But other than that, I mean, if, if they would have done that one thing, just, you know, I mean, man, they were so close. Like, just give it an extra half. I'm talking a half inch here. Give it another half inch of throw and, and you would have a really, really good product, I think. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's bad. It just would have been ideal. And then, of course, we'll see how long it lasts. Man, look at that ortho. Juicy. Yes, Daniel Ortiz, that is ortho, uh, that's fork boy ortho. Christian says, with the stick, I'm okay with it being out of the box. Flight Factor 320, though, whole different story. It feels so sensitive to any small input. Can't wait for you to do some curves. Oh, so I haven't even attempted the Flight Factor yet, Christian. Was it you that posted the curves in the Discord? I, whoever that member was, I appreciate it because I'm going to, I've got a screenshot of that. I'm going to do that. The Tolis, I mean, Tolis, man, they are on it. I can't say enough good things about these guys. The setup for the Tolis is extremely easy to get the reverse detent working, get your climb detents working. All you have to do here is click this button on. I literally plugged the thrust lever quadrant into my computer and I just clicked reverse on same access here in the IC, ISCS and everything worked out of the box. The detents work fine by default. You can adjust these. Of course, if you're removing detents or if you want to customize it, you can adjust these right here. But I think this often goes overlooked. And I'm talking, you know, you got the Flight Factor 320. I don't know if there's other FADEC aircraft in the sim that would, maybe the JAR design or, 
none of these other Airbus designers really nailed this. This is an overlooked option here that is so easy to manipulate for you guys, for the consumer. It just, it's it's great. So I haven't even attempted the flight factor yet. I know there is a way to set it up. You got to use custom curves via the X-Plane menu. So I'm going to do it. And I can imagine I probably have to put some curves on the joystick for that as well. I personally think, you guys ask me all the time, which one flies better, Flight Factor, Tolus, Flight Factor? I think the Tolus fly-by-wire feels better than the Flight Factor. I really do, 100%. I think the 321, in my opinion, is the most accurate feeling. But I will say this, and I'll probably totally ball up the landing in Phoenix now because I'm jinxing myself. But I've been running this setup now for four or five days, maybe, maybe a week actually. I've done probably seven or eight flights with it offline, off stream. And with zero curves on the Thrustmaster Airbus side stick, zero curves, zero saturation, just 100% linear, I feel like I have a more accurate representation of the fly-by-wire feeling than I did with my curves on my Warthog. So, and I know Tolis, and what I mean by curves, I'm saying the wrong thing. Since we're not online, let me just show you. Control sensitivity is what I'm, what I'm looking at. Side stick. So look, control response and stability augmentation. I have everything off. Whereas my Warthog, well, it's off now because I moved it. it. I think it moves it for all of them, right? But if with my Warthog, I'm pretty sure I had those on because I remember moving them when I put this new side stick in there. I think this actually might fly better with zero stability augmentation on there. Now, hopefully I don't ball up the landing, but I've had some pretty good landings with this side stick the way it is. Dougal, you replaced the spring with a lighter one. That's a good idea. I know there's been guys that have done that as well. <laughs> Chris, let's talk about that. I've been watching for the availability of the flap spoid brake add-on modules. Currently have those commands bound to the side stick button, but that's no fun. All right, so thank you, Christian, for that post. It is that it was yours. So, thank you, Martin. I appreciate it. Here we go. I want to talk about this, and hopefully you guys don't get mad at me. But we're level 370. Everything looks good. Okay, here we go. So, you guys have been asking me, what, well, are you going to get the spoid break and flap combo add-on? All right, let me go over this real quick here. I don't have a picture of the Thrustmaster combo. Well, maybe I do. I can. Uh, not of this, not of the spoid break and flap add-on. Here is why I am not going to get those additional add-ons. Now, this is just me. So if you are dying to get them and you want to get them, by all means, go ahead. You're going to love it. I'm sure it's going to be fun for you. But the reason I'm not going to, and if you watched my review video, which if you haven't, go ahead and check it out. It's only like 10 minutes long or something. Um, the reason I got this setup is because I want to create positive reinforcement of muscle memory. What I was doing with the right-handed stick and left throttles, I was creating negative muscle memory for when I fly the real airplane. The problem with getting the spoid brake add-on and the flat parking brake add-on is the positions are not accurate. And there is a crucial misinterpretation. I wouldn't say misinterpretation. It's probably just the way they did it. But what they did with the add-on is they moved the parking brake adjacent, if I'm not mistaken, adjacent to the flap retraction lever or the flap lever itself. So on the way Thrustmaster has it set up, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know what, let me just see if I can pull up a photo. I hate doing this on stream. I don't want to wreck my uh, Wi-Fi here. Let me just do this here. Thrustmaster officer pack flap add-on images. And here, this one. All right. And I want to turn this on here. Oh, don't want to do that. That might ruin the stream quality. How do I pull this up here? Give me a second, guys. (laughs) 
All right, here we go. Hopefully you can see that now, but what I'm looking at is the parking brake. Look at the position of the flap lever and the parking brake lever. The parking brake lever in the Thrustmaster rendition is exactly where the flap handle is in the real aircraft. Just down and to the right of the engine start switches. <laughs> this is a big time no-no for me, in my opinion, because there has been times where there have been FOs and captains that have said, all right, I'm going to, you know, flaps, set flaps for takeoff, and they set the parking brake on while the airplane is rolling, or vice versa. You know, you set the, you move the flap lever instead of the parking brake. This is not a good situation for me. So I will not be purchasing this add-on because that just, that looks like a, a perfect recipe to create very bad muscle memory and where you can accidentally set the parking brake while you're in pushback when you go to extend flaps or whatever it may have you. So I'm not going to be getting that add on. As far as the speed brake lever, um, I don't like having the gear lever there. I understand why they do it. This auto brake selector is not represent representative at all of the narrow body that we have that I operate. I think this is more of a wide body 330 thing um, where they have this selector. So I'm not really interested in that. Now, the one thing that would have skewed my opinion, and maybe I would have done it, is if the spoiled brake lever had the ability to arm and the flap lever had detents and the proper manipulators. So if I arm the spoiled brakes here, check this out. See how it goes up and down? That's how you arm your spoiled brakes. You can't do that with the TCA add-on. And the flap lever does not operate as... Um, mechanically as it's supposed to in the real airplane you don't lift up like you have to lift up this lever pinch these two together in order to deploy the flaps or retract the flaps so for those reasons and especially the fact that the parking brake would be in the wrong spot for me I'm not uh, not even gonna do that I touch that parking brake all the time on the ground and I don't want to reach down there and create something here at my desk so that's why I'm gonna stay away from that add-on but let me go ahead and I forgot I left that thing on there for you. Let me go ahead and get rid of that. Get rid of that browser source. Now we're back. Now we're cooking with gas again here. So that's why I'm going to stay away from it. But if you guys, you know, if you're not flying the real airplane, you have nothing to worry about. It could be fun by all means. I'm not here to tell you how to spend your money. But that's just my opinion why I'm not going to go that route. But I am happy with what I've got. And I think I'm going to keep it that way. Chris, exactly right. They didn't model the pull up to arm function. So that's uh, that's just kind of sad. That's I'm not going to just have a lever. I use what I use for the spoil brakes now is the on the TCA side stick. They have that slider right behind the stick. That's what I use for spoil brakes. All right, so we're up here in cruise. How are we doing? We got 254 miles. We're getting ready to start prepping for our top of descent here. We'll spend a little bit more time outside. Let's go back outside here for a couple more minutes. Enjoy some Fork Boy Ortho. Oh, oh, oh man, look at that. Let's enjoy that for a little bit. Maybe we can bump up the sound one notch. What are the numbers in the middle of the thrust levers for? That's just a... I believe that's a... Thr is it thrust lever angle? I don't have a thrust lever angular percentage. I know it means something. Uh, somebody told me at one point, but I, most of the time, when you actually have your hand on the thrust levers, you can't see those numbers because your wrists will block. Will block that. I'm pretty sure it's just position, or I don't think it's thrust lever angle. It's uh, just kind of a general percentage or something. Nah, so maybe someone in chat has the correct answer. Captain Geo, what is going on? Good to see you here. Trying to scroll back. I know I missed a lot of chats there. Liam, welcome.
welcome, man. How are you? It's been a while. Yes, it has, man. I'm doing good. I hope you are well. We are just about ready to start our descent preparation into Phoenix Sky Harbor. And we're going to try to use manual thrust here with the Thrustmaster Quadrant. We'll see how it goes. Are the numbers by the throttle maybe for the trim? No. You're, if you're talking about, so in the real airplane you have, like if I'll show you here again in the cockpit. So this is your trim settings right here. This is how Airbus recommends you set the trim now, 31, 32, 33%, whatever it may be, as opposed to the percentage, which will it show in flight? Yeah, so right now it's just 0 .4, 0 0.4 degrees down. That's an old way to do it. It's kind of how the original way to do it. In, in the perf takeoff phase, it asks you to use like down 0.4, 0 0.4, whatever. But this can be mistaken, and you could set this wrong, because if it's 0.4, it doesn't matter 0.4 positive or negative. So you can actually set the trim backwards by looking at this. That's why Airbus recommends that you use these numbers here to set the trim. This is just for your your thrust lever. So you can see zero all the way to 45%. I'm not, you know, I know there's a reason for this here. And I'm sure I was told at some point, but I just don't remember guys. So apologize for that. I'm sure someone in chat or the comments will. We always have some Airbus engineer in chat or <laughs> in the comments. It's the TLA thrust lever angle. Perfect. All right. So I was, my hunch was correct. Rex Royce, what is up, man? He says, I did my first local solo about an hour ago. Felt amazing. I was very nervous, but training mode kicks in while holding short. I hope you're doing good. Rex Royce, that is fantastic, dude. Congratulations on your first solo, man. I still remember mine. That's that's awesome. It's a great feeling, and you're just going to want to get back up there, man. Just after it sinks in for a little bit tomorrow, two days from now, you'll be like, wow, that was I flew an airplane by myself. That's awesome, man. Congratulations, Rex. Ah, uh, Jeremy, did I see your comment? I did not. Let me uh, see if I can scroll back up. It says, on the real stick, when you hit a limit of travel, it feels softer. And on regular joysticks, when you hit a limit, it feels like you're hitting a wall. The real stick is smoother. Definitely. It definitely is. I think the War Dog does a pretty good job of being kind of a dampened limit. But here's the thing. The only time you're ever going to really hit a limit in the airplane is if you're doing an Egypt Whiz memory item. So if you get a Jip Whiz call out, terrain, terrain. For, or might, might happen during the winter, but the Jip Whiz is the one I can think of off the top of my head where the memory item is you physically pull full aft on the stick and you just hold it there. So if you get any terrain call out, it's autopilot off, full aft stick, all the way to the stops, thrust levers, toga. Because you're going to let, that's what that's going to do is it's going to allow the aircraft to use its protections to keep you at the maximum. AOA and maximum performance. You won't stall. You got that slow speed protection, you got AOA protection, you got G load protection. So if you just rip it full aft, it's going to keep you in normal law, mind you. You can only do this in normal law. But you just rip full aft on that side stick, and we do it in the sim all the time. And what it'll do is just going to pitch you right up, maximum AOA, maximum lift over drag, and you're just going to climb away from the ground. So also want to make sure your speed brakes are retracted, but your speed brakes will retract anyway when you go uh, toga thrust courtesy of the unfortunate crew of the 757 was it in cali they, they uh hit a mountain jip whiz they did everything correct as far as the jip whiz goes but they left the speed brakes out and they hit the top of the mountain if they had the speed brakes retracted they would have cleared it so now you got that auto retract on the speed brakes any suggestions on how to butter an airbus Harmony, focus on getting her down in the zone first, and then work on uh, the buttering technique. Buttering is uh, <laughs> is weird. It's a weird f theory of flying in the YouTube communities, I guess. I mean, everyone wants a butter. Don't get me wrong. Of course you want a butter. You don't want to slam it down. But I don't actively, unless I'm trying to, like maybe we're doing a challenge or something, I'm not actively striving for uh, a butter. In the real airplane, it's you're looking outside if you want to get a butter just make sure your vsi is pretty much at zero when you touch down but what you need to focus on first in, in my opinion is pick a spot on the runway where you want to touch down and start touching down there and once you consistently are able to put the airplane down on the spot that you want to be now you can focus in on timing that flare just a little bit better to where you've really arrested that sink rate so 
when you when that thrust levers come back to idle and you're pitching up the flare just kind of hold it off and she should touch down of course it'll depend on wind and everything too but <laughs> magical zulu this is so ironic that you were asking me this question because I was about to do a video on this, a standalone video, and I think I will do it. And I wish you would have said something. I Maybe you weren't here in the beginning, but I wish I would have remembered a, you would have said something in the beginning because I would have done a manual start. I was, I'm going to do a, a video on the manual start. So Magical Zulu is asking, what's the manual start procedure, and why do you have these buttons on the overhead? So up here, you have engine, man, start, push buttons. I don't even know if they are... Uh, they're modeled I'm gonna find out for you and then make a video for you but what would happen is if you have an automatic start fault so let's say you have a over temp EGT over temp on an automatic start what will happen the FADIC will automatically abort the start will commence a dry quaint dry quanking dry cranking sequence to clear the engine and then it will spool off from there you're gonna go to the com or you can do your procedures and then you're gonna it's gonna call for a manual start so for a manual start, you're going to move the ignition switch to ignition start. You're going to press the manual start push button on the overhead. What that does is that begins spooling the starter. So when you press this button, it will actually begin to spool the starter. You're going to wait 30 seconds. At the end of 30 seconds, you're going to be probably about 27 to 30% N2, which at that point you will then move the start master to on which will introduce fuel and you should get a light off. So that's the manual start procedure in a nutshell. I'm gonna do that for you in a video and if I remember on the next stream, maybe we can do a manual start as well. But <laughs> no worries, Magical Zulu. It's just, it's so funny you bring that up because I was thinking I'm either gonna to stream today or I wanna do a manual start tutorial. But uh, there you have it. That's an engine manual start. So you're basically starting it like a 1960s Boeing and how they do it in present day, so. When does the PLI come into view? Sometimes I see the red V, sometimes I don't. Pitch limit indicator during uh, the approach and landing phase and takeoff. So you'll see it come down when we're on the approach in. Is it uh, 1,000 feet? There's an altitude associated with it. But you'll see the PLI drop down. And also, you will see it in a, and I don't, that wouldn't be correct if I said wind shear. There's a couple other instances when the PLI will drop down. But yeah, that PLI, when it comes down, that's your pitch limit indicator. It will not pitch up any more than that. So, you'll see that if you do a jip whiz as well. Any good techniques you recommend for gusty landing conditions in the Airbus? Do you wait a bit longer to retard the thrust or anything special? So that one's a tough one to kind of discuss in sim world because landing any airplane in gusty conditions is all about energy management and that's where you really need to feel the quote unquote seat of your pants right so when you're in the actual airplane you can tell when you are at the front end of a gust right in the middle of a gust or at the tail end of a gust and what you have to do in the real airplane as well with any airplane, not even just the Airbus, is you have to judge multiple factors at the same time. Your, your descent rate, your distance from the touchdown zone or the, the touchdown spot on the runway where you actually want to land, and the energy state of the aircraft. So in the Airbus, if I'm really gusty, number one, your VAP is going to be bumped up. So you can bump up your VAP all the way up to a maximum of VLS plus 15 knots. So if you look in your McDo, we got to start getting our destination data set. Matter of fact, let me just do a standby on that. Let's close this out real quick. we got to pull up uh, Pionix. And next phase. 29084. And this is, here we go. So 29084. So you see how I got VLS there? What are the winds doing? Hopefully it was really windy. Nope, zero eight zero at four. Three three. Good night. So, in gusty conditions, you can increase your VAP up to, to not to exceed VLS plus fifteen knots. So in this case, we go. What's that? One thirty nine and five is one forty four. 
So you can go all the way up to 144. VAP is going to be VLS plus 5 corrected automatically for you per Airbus. So that's really what you're striving for. But if it was really gusty, I'll add two or three knots, maybe four knots. But again, you got to be careful that you don't exceed VLS plus 15. And as far as the landing technique, that retard call out that you get. What are we on? We're on the bruiser. Let me just get a bottom altitude here so we don't go blowing by this. Bottom altitude on the bruiser, a descend via clearance for the runway 8 transition is going to be 6,000. So we'll set 6,000 here in the box. Then we'll do a brief. So that retard callout does not know if it's gusty or not. That retard callout is basically just kind of an RA. It, it knows when you're 30 feet, I think it's 30, it's 30 feet, RA comes out, you can get that retard, reminding you to bring the thrust levers to idle. If the aircraft is in a high energy state, and I am potentially going into a high, or maybe a, an increasing gust, I'm right at the beginning of a gust, and I'm already a high energy state, if I see I'm V at plus maybe two already, plus three, I'm going to just bring that power to idle, and I'm going to use the remainder of my pitch to kind of control that speed as I touch down. You're only about 30 feet, so it's going to happen quick. But if I get that retard call out, and I'm already behind the power curve, maybe my engines have already spooled down. This is a problem that you'll get into, as all bus drivers know, is you can't really override. You can't not... You can't override the thrust levers when the auto thrust is on. You either have to have it on and trust it, or you got to turn it off and use manual thrust, not like a Boeing or an Embraer. So if you're riding the back end of the power curve, maybe you just came out of a gust, and because you had that increase of performance, the thrust levers already went to, or the thrust already commanded almost idle, your VAP or VAP minus a knot or two, and you know you're falling out the back end of a gust, I'm going to leave those thrust levers in there a little bit longer, maybe even to just prior to touchdown. Now, you got to be careful because if you, and especially single engine, it's a different ball game. All right, here comes five miles prior to top of decent. I'm going to go ahead and push for manage. We're going to start down. But I'm going to leave those thrust levers in there just a little bit longer, depending on the energy state of the aircraft. Where it will bite you, especially single engine, is it'll start, it'll really start spooling up to maintain that speed and then you'll really start floating. Same thing with two engines operating too. If you leave it in too long, those engines are really going to start to spool up. You got to be ready to chop that auto thrust off. But it's hard, it's really hard to simulate that on any sim other than, you know, the $10 million full motion sims that we train on. So you just kind of go by feeling in the real airplane. All right, so we got our bruiser, we got our altitudes in there, and we're going to be doing the eight. We're going to be a visual, so we'll do a full-blown visual approach. We're going to back it up with the ILS-8. Didn't you say it's a good thing to do gust is add half the gust factor? Yes, Christian, so when you're talking about severe gusts, so let's say it's like 080 at 10, gust 27. What you want to do is add half the gust immediately. So when you got a really big gust factor, 17 knot gust factor, I'm going to go right there. I'm going to cut 17 in half. I'm just going to call it 8, which would be really 6, you know, 8 and 8 is 16, so it's almost. I'm going to go 8 knots right away, making sure that I'm still not VLS plus 15. If I reach my correction is VLS plus 15, that's all I can do. You don't want to do anything else. At that point, you're starting to land. You're starting to lie to your landing data and your landing performance numbers, and you could end off at the end of, end of the runway. So you got to be careful with that. I mean, man, we had a couple of weeks there here in Dallas where it was 38, 40 knot winds for a week, and I was flying pretty much that entire week. And I tell you what, man, I definitely increased my personal minimums for winds. I don't know what I'm doing. Why did I just set 250 there? 1368 is set. LS push buttons on. We're down descending V. I'm going to come over here, put you in below mode. And it does typically get just bumpy here on the descent. We'll turn that seatbelt sign on. Edwin Lee says, when, when I land the 321, I nearly always get hot brakes. It never happens in the 319. Any idea why? Are you significantly heavier? The 321 is heavier airplane. Also, are you using medium brakes? Also, are you using full reverse thrust? And what's your outside air temperature? <laughs> a lot of different factors will apply, Edwin. In a 321, anything above 75 degrees 
Fahrenheit, which is 25 Celsius. If you use auto brakes down to about 60 knots, you're probably going to get hot brakes. It's just it, that now the severity is going to is going to depend, of course, on other factors. But in real life, I think it's pretty safe to say if you use auto brakes down to 60 knots and it's above 25 C outside, you're going to get hot brakes at some point. You may only get up to 330 or 340 degrees, but that's totally normal. That's that's normal. What you want to avoid is that 500, 600, <laughs> 700 degrees. And if it reaches 800 degrees, you can't even get ground crew on the aircraft. What does the crank position do on the ignition start switch? Does exactly what you think. It cranks the starter, man. No fuel injection, just keeps the crank, just cranks the starter. Uh, Jeremy says, why do we say that a stall is an AOA problem and not directly a speed problem, especially when alpha floor is based on speed? Alpha floor is not based on speed. You can trigger alpha floor at Mach 8 if you do it, if you do it correctly. So a stall, Jeremy, has nothing to do with speed, believe it or not. It all has to do with angle of attack. Now, we traditionally think a stall is with speed because we slow down. But you have to define the angle of attack. Angle of attack is the angle between the core line and the relative wind. What is relative? What does that mean? It well, means the current direction of the wind. So my relative wind can change depending on what position I put the aircraft in. If I pitch up, I am increasing the angle of attack. So I could be doing Mach 8.0 and if I increase the angle of attack, the relative wind is going to exceed the critical angle of attack and it's going to cause laminar flow separation and a stall. So you have to remember, and it's really hard for me to just kind of go over that while I'm just basically talking to you here on stream. I'd love to use visuals and I love teaching aerodynamics and all that. So, but you got to remember that it's a stall is defined as the exceedance of relative wind and the critical angle of attack. That, that's a that's a wormhole question jeremy maybe i'll d do a stream in like a 172 or something and we can just dive into aerodynamics and advanced aerodynamics which actually would be pretty good i got to do my advanced uh eet training here coming up again how do you set up the mcdo and ths values for touch and goes in an airbus you don't even have to worry about it the harmony if you do a, if you do a go around or touch and go Go toga, 15 degrees. You'll get off the ground, man. Unless you have manually messed up this trim. If this is in the green, you see this arrow right here? If this arrow is pointing to green anywhere on this trim wheel, the airplane's going to fly. It's going to fly for you. And as soon as you rotate and get out of that SRS blend mode on a go-around or a touch-and-go, it's going to all correct. It's going to auto-trim for you every time. Very, very easy to set up. If you want to watch a video where I did a bunch of touch and goes, check out my landing tutorial that I have on a landing tutorial stream where I took the 319, the 320, and the 321 up. And all we did is landings. All we did is traffic pattern work. Alex, I'm getting that same air, man. The website's down. Holger Deutsch, welcome. Says, uh, what about when to retard at steep descents, 3.8 earlier or later? <laughs> Holger Deutsch, so that will actually start, now you start talking about steep approach capabilities of the airplanes. We do not have any Airbus in the sim that is equipped with the steep approach function. I believe that will actually take and that that would actually modify the retard call out I, I don't i'd have to look in the manuals for a steep approach function and what it actually changes but to just answer your question here for sim purposes if you're coming in at a steep angle 3.8 really what's going to affect when you retard the thrust levers is not necessarily the angle of which you're coming down but rather your descent rate your vertical speed and your TAS and your ground speed. So 
and that kind of goes into when you want to flare, timing your flare. This kind of leads into our high density altitude. So we're landing here in the desert, Phoenix, Arizona, 1,000 feet above sea level, 33C outside, high density altitude. I'm going to have a high true airspeed and coincidentally a higher ground speed as well. You combine that with a faster sink rate and descent rate, you have to start flaring a little bit earlier because when you go to flare, the airplane's not gonna be as responsive, right? Because you're at that higher density altitude. It's now acting like it's at much higher altitude, 10,000 feet, 8,000 feet, even though we're landing on the ground and we're 1,000 feet above sea level. That is a, a another great question, which I wish I'd, we could do a whole high density altitude stream, which we may have to. But generally speaking, Holger Teuschen, I'm, I'm just trying to make a general statement here because it, it depends on a lot of different variables. But yes, when you are coming in steeper, as long as if your vertical speed is, is higher and you're on a steeper approach path, you're doing 800, 900 feet per minute descent rate, high ground speed, you're going to need to flare a little bit earlier. And that retarder than me because they, you know, <laughs> they have to comment on that stuff so that's my generalization for you man but yes you are correct pull out the NACA charge oh no dude please no <laughs> oh buffer What does SRS mean? Hopefully you're back with me. SRS is Speed Reference System. Jeremy Harvey says, so the red barber pole and tiger tail will move based on AOA? Jeremy Harvey, you're absolutely correct. Yes, it will. And it will move depending on your configuration of the aircraft as well. If you're, and you can really see this in a heavy 321, if you're taking off flaps one, and you retract your flaps, you're gonna see that tiger tail start coming up to bite you. That's where you gotta be careful. You're absolutely right, Jeremy. It will move based on your angle of attack. <laughs> Aaron says the call outs for steep approach are standby, standby, flare. Exclamation of flare always makes me laugh. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, see, I've never flown an Airbus with the steep approach function. I've never flown one. I think that'd be pretty sweet. All right, what's our current METAR down here in uh, Sky Harbor 29 or 88. We never did an approach brief, but that's okay. 29 or 88. It's going to be visual. You got any questions? No. Cool deal. There we go. 29 or 88 set approach checklist briefing complete. ECAM status is checked. Seatbelts on minimums. 1368 set. Approach stable by. This is a big one. We got to be stable. 1,000 feet above touchdown. It's 1130. Call it 1200. So we've got to be stable by 2200 feet. Engine anti-ice is off. Altimeters 29 or 88 set approach checklist is complete. Let's go outside here, watch a little bit of this coming down here, and then we'll spend the majority of the rest of our flight inside. Man, you guys had some really great questions right towards the end of the stream where I'm starting to get dry and <laughs> running out of running out of breath here. But you actually gave me some really good ideas about maybe a high density altitude stream and just a full blown aerodynamics lesson. Sergey, thank you so much for your $10 uh, donation there. He says, in Tolis, I just got nav IR1 fail. Is it correct that it gave me TCAS standby and JIPWIZ terrain system failures? Shouldn't it pick up from third system just like captain's PFD? So, sorry, I don't know how the mic cut out there. You just had nav IR1 fail. Is it correct? TCAS standby and JIP was terrain system failures. Shouldn't it pick up from third system? Yes. JIP was terrain system failure is correct. 
because you've lost one of your IRs, so your position is is invalid. So you lose the advanced function of your eGipWiz. You still have GipWiz, but you lose the enhanced function. And TCAS standby, are you sure it doesn't say RA mode off or just TA only? It might say TA only. Uh, Sergey, I need, I need a little bit more uh, information on that. Nav IR one fault, so you came up here, you had IR fail. The IR, if it's not recoverable, you could do, nope, you got air data. Attitude Henning, what you would do if you want to get your ECAM back is go uh, FO3. So what that'll do is that'll pick up from the third switch. So you want to move your switching panel to FO3, and then you'll get your stuff back over here. But as far as the fault light, that's okay up here because you just lost the E part of the JIPWIZ, but you still have traditional JIPWIZ. But that is, uh, that is correct. Not a huge fault, but you should be all right. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the dono, man. I hope that helps. I hope you get on the ground safely. Hopefully, you don't have any more compounding failures. How often does an FO actually end up having questions? Depends on how long they've been on the airplane. Really, depends on how long they've been on the airplane. Sam says I've had the tiger tail almost bite me in the 321 when loading the wings. Was retracting flap slats as I was rolling into a turn during the climb. Yep, that'll get you, man. Vodka says, I just read a thing of Starlink goes in an active mode of 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Ew. I mean, it gets hot in Texas, but I don't think it gets up to 118, so hopefully we don't have that issue. My internet is starting to have issues already. Uh, Hope, just stand by on upper ECAM, and ATC on Vastim still sees me. The On the selector has a TARA. Hmm. But you did get your PFD back, right, Sergey? If you move that switch to uh, position three over here on the first one, attitude heading, you should get your PFD back. How's the TCA officer pack working out for you? We talked about a little bit vanilla sky. You know, I have my I have my issues with a couple of things on it, a couple of small things, but I've said it before and. You know, I'm definitely not anti-Thrustmaster or anything like that. In fact, I highly, highly recommend their Warthog setup. I'm, it's still fun for me. I enjoy it. Um, we're going to do an auto-thrust-off approach on this one. Some guys have been saying they've had some asymmetrical thrust issues. I haven't experienced that yet, but we're going to try to find that or duplicate that today with an auto-thrust-off approach. But other than, you know, my minor things that I don't like about it, I still enjoy it. It's still fun. I'm not, I don't regret my purchase. Um... But that's, you know, I'm, I'm an Airbus nut, so I love having Airbus stuff. Just being able to put my hands on an actual thrust lever that is modeled after the Airbus, I like it. I enjoy it. Now, how long will it last? I have no idea. Hopefully, it'll last a long time, but we'll see. Fubar, coming in with a $5 bomb. Thank you so much, man. He says, uh, thank you for awesome information. I appreciate all you do, V1. Thank you so much, Fubar. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that, Fubar. Thank you so much, man. Sergey, you got your PFD back. That's good. Good. Yeah, we're starting to drop some hardcore frames here. I don't know what's going on. All right, we're at 10,000 feet. Let's go ahead and turn the lights on. Since we'll Go ahead and get all these on. Boom, boom. Ding the flight attendants. We're going to go ahead and select speed 250. We're going to activate and confirm. I know there's a speed restriction on the arrival. Jeremy, no problem, man. Yeah, it's it is based on AOA, man. So 
Now, in a normal configure, like in a normal situation, yeah, speed of course takes into account. If you're too slow, you you will stall. But it's not because your speed is slow. It's because the relative win and the angle of attack have exceeded the wing's critical angle of attack because you're trying to maintain whether it be it's an example level flight and you've gotten so slow that angle of attack keeps getting bigger and bigger to maintain level flight that it's gotten to the point where it can't maintain it anymore so then it's going to stall but that can happen at any speed all right my internet is really starting to struggle hopefully we uh, can recover this for landing here we're going to go ahead and go open descent down to 4,000. Thrust idle, open descent. I'm using the IAE engines. Edwin Lee coming with a five pound donation. Thank you so much, man. He says, great video, Captain. I learned a lot. Edwin, thank you so much, man. I appreciate the donation, man. I'm glad you guys are learning. We got onto a roll there. You guys had some really good questions that I wish I, I would, it would take me probably an hour plus to discuss, you know, half, just several of those questions individually. So high density altitude, we could talk all day about high density altitude. We could talk all day about um, high altitude aerodynamics, aerodynamics of the Airbus wing itself, speeds, critical angles of attack. We could talk all day on that. Uh, who else had another good question? Uh, landing techniques in, in severe wind, watching about engine pod clearance, wingtip clearance. You don't really have to worry about that. You'll strike the pod first tail strike clearance and gusty conditions I could talk to you all day about that so you guys actually had some really good questions that I apologize I had to kind of get some quick generic answer out there Holger Toich had a great one about increasing your wind to retard thrust when you're on a steeper angle that plays into high density altitude or high descent rate so I could talk for hours on that one so you guys had some really good questions I hope I got some information out there for you but those questions are very like a, with a lot of things aviation there are so many variables that you really have to be careful when you just give a blanket answer and try to cover all aspects because it can there are so many different intricacies and little things that will change that can cause a that can cause your answer to, to change as well so Vikas 100 rupees thank you so much man he says I have a complete Airbus setup even flying the 7.3 with it feels good just have the remote latch at the bottom four screws and put it back after a 180 there you go man yeah I love it I mean I'm I, I am a, I am enjoying my thrust levers, no doubt about it. <laughs> Ivy, just wanted to say good luck. We're all counting on you. Thank you, sir. Would love to hear more info about high adult, uh, high, high, uh, about high altitude swept wing aerodynamics from you and how they are different from low altitude straight wing aerodynamics. Sam, I think we might have to have a members only discussion here this week. Because that would actually be very helpful for me because I have to go in and, and do this myself with our advanced uh, training. Uh, but, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. It's on the list, man. I'm definitely going to do that. All right, we said we're going to do a visual approach. Let's fly. I'm going to turn everything off here. I'm going to go uh, 3,000. Open descent. Autopilot off. Thrust levers idle. Flight director's off. LS push button's off. Give me the bird. I need maximum birds in chat. Let's go ahead and get this thing rolling here. Let's turn it in. And we'll, give the, we'll leave the LS on just for a reference for our localizer slope, but everything is off. We're going to hand fly. I wish I had my track IR on right now. That's 100%. 3,000 set missed approach altitude. That works for me. Need a little speed break. Let's go ahead and slow her down. I'm not going to be paying attention to chat here, guys. I'm going full visual approach mode. I actually haven't even done a hand-flown approach with these thrust levers yet, so let's give it a shot. There's VFE next minus 10, flaps 1. We're going to fly through the localizer for runway 8. That's okay. I'm going to level off, maintain 3,000. Track the spoilage brakes. Coming all the way back to 180. <laughs> Sergey coming in with another super chat. He says, WTF, there goes ELAC 1 and FAC 2 just waiting for those engines to fail. Uh-oh, Sergey, you got a, a compound failure going on, man. I wish I could help you out, man. I, if I was in your cockpit, I'd be able to diagnose probably a little bit better. VFE next minus 10 flaps 2. 
ELAC 1, FAC 2. You're still okay, though, Sergey. You're still okay. I would consider perhaps uh, an alternate airport, though, soon. <laughs> oh, good. We just had a weather reload. All right, here we go. I hate looking at my ND all jacked up like that, but... See, there we go. See, I just moved the thrust up, and I just... That's, that's where that uh, no thrust lever detent situation is. Meh. All right, I can barely make out the runway. We're coming up on two whites, two reds. Here comes the slope. And gear down. VFA next minus 10, flaps 3. VFA next minus 10, flaps full. Arm the spoid brakes. Three degree path here. Get back on center line. Landing checklist, cabin crew advised, auto thrust is off. ECAM memo. Landing all green. Landing checklist complete. My child is having a bad day. Yes, this is Phoenix. Oh man, we've been rocking that idle thrust here pretty good. All right, now my thrust levers are pretty symmetrical. I mean, it's not uncommon to see a little difference here and there. This is where, let's see, if I do a correction though. Yeah, see, I have to, I'm so careful when you're using your corrections here. 1.05 is 1.04 here for a 319. Should hold us about on the app. So I got 1.03, 1.04. I'd say it, it's a tad off, but nothing abnormal. About 1.04 on the EPR should hold you VAP here on the slope. You know, 319. Of course, depending on wind. Stable, clear to land, down to land. Here we go. I'm really liking the left side of the runway here for some reason. Let's get back on the center line. We don't have to worry about views because we do have replay mode. Landing. All right, gonna dip below here. Non-coinciding path. Still holding those two whites in. One hundred. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Retard. Ten. Five. Spoilers. Reverse screen. I do love those detents. 125 on this one. I didn't see what the other one was, if it even popped up or not. 70 knots. Manual braking. Forty-nine feet above threshold. One foot from center line with a 125 butter juice. It doesn't get much better than that. Maybe like a 30 feet per minute, but hey, I'll take it. Let's take this taxiway, right turn into the alley. Start the clock here. And I kind of missed or blew through this on the last stream. After landing flows for the captain, there's a big trigger here. As soon as I disarm the spoil brakes, that's gonna trigger the FO into doing his flow. And then all I do is shut these lights off here. Back to auto. And then he's going to go ahead and retract the flaps. Transponder, TCAS, all that. So I've got to kind of do both flows here. But if I want him to be heads up, I won't move that spoil brake lever. Missed the super chats there coming in. Um, 
V or the Harmony. Welcome to Private Pilot, the Harmony. Exclamation point. Welcome for your new perks, man. Welcome aboard the stream, dude. Glad to have you on. Glad to have you on board. Podcasts for you. Emojis for you. If you're a Discord user, sync your uh, YouTube to your Discord account and get the V1 After Dark channel as well. I got to post my Dunkin' Donuts to my members. <laughs> I'm going to be doing a lot more traveling here, guys, a lot more overnights and in the, in the coming months as flying picks back up. So I've got some I've got some good stuff planned for you members. You just hang tight. All right. We're going to simulate that we've had a three minute cool down. We'll go ahead and secure engine number two. Yellow electric pump is on. Confirm two. confirm. We'll go ahead and secure that. And we'll take uh, what's this Bravo two over here in the corner. Go ahead and kill the taxi light. Keep her rolling. Keep her rolling. I'm going to swing a little bit wide. Not much. That's a good way to strike a wingtip. This is where you need track IR. It is so much easier to park the airplane in real life than it is in the sim without track IR. I know I'm not straight yet. I feel like I'm not straight. Why are you telling me I'm straight? I don't think I'm straight. Er Brake set. Let's connect external power. Engine one. Secured. Seatbelt sign. 5% and one. There it is. We'll kill the beacon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Phoenix Sky Harbor. Man, that was fun. We had a good stream there. That was a lot of fun hand flying that approach. I got to do that more often. We got to take a look at that replay. Vikas, he said, I missed your super chat there. What I miss, man? In real life, do you disconnect the auto throttle and fly it down to the runway like a Boeing or do you keep on climb detent 50, 30 feet? I will disconnect the auto thrust um, whenever I feel like it on an approach. You know, wow, that was a terrible parking job. Look at that. I'm not even on the on the stripe up here, but he told me to stop. So, you know, you can hand fly. Some airlines make you keep the auto thrust on. It just depends, man. It really just depends on on when you uh, when you shut it off. That auto that retard call out is going to be about 30 feet. <laughs> Fubar says I have to go outside and park. Yeah, it's. It's hard to park in the sim. All right, let's go replay mode here. Let's get rid of sail for a second. I want to see that landing. That was a beautiful. Not often do I get to say my landing was beautiful. That was a beautiful landing, I think. All hand flowing. Sometimes it's nice to just shut everything off and fly the airplane, man. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Jungles. I appreciate it. Did the other landing rate pop up? I'm just curious why it been having issues with it it should have popped up like on the fly live thing up here did you guys see it pop up i don't know why it's not working the harmony says thank you for all the super detailed streams the harmony my pleasure man my pleasure you guys are why i do this content it never ceases to amaze me how much uh, you guys enjoy picking up on on little things so i love doing it i think i have an ortho problem i don't do i have ortho down here maybe i do there's bob or the old bob i don't even know what that stadium is now Speaking of podcasts, the last podcast was amazing. Thank you, man. Yeah, I got to get the Kawadi Mundi emoji. I've <laughs> whoever suggested I need a Kawadi Mundi salute. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to get I'm going to make one. We got room for another emoji. Vikas, you mean to get butter? Man, it's it's all about energy management, man. If you pull it at about 30 feet, you should have enough energy to just watch that flare. Depending on the wind, if you pull it at 30 feet, you should be good. Oh, it did pop up. Good. Okay, good. All right, we'll watch this touchdown here, and then we'll go outside and we'll see. 49 feet over the threshold, one foot from center line. Oh, yeah. Now it says 133, and it says 150. I'll take it. Beautiful. Man. Let's watch this view right here. So this is what I'm talking about. That side stick... 
it's a little squirrely with no stability augmentation or anything, but it honestly feels better in the flare mode. It does. It, it does feel better in the flare mode. Coming down. Oh, yeah. Let's watch one more here. We're going to start getting out of here. And then we're going to start getting out of here. Dougal says, I missed a few super chats from Vikas. Uh-oh. Sorry, Vikas. Started bombing me there on a final approach. Yeah, to get those butters, if you pull that thrust to idle around 30 feet, you should be all right. But again, the key to getting a butter, in my opinion, is don't worry about getting butters right away. That's really loud. Hold on. What you need to do is worry about putting the airplane where you want it to be first. And then once you are consistently landing where you want to be landing, then focus on trying to smoothen it out and get butters. But until you can put her down where you want to put her down, that would be my, my suggestion to you, my friend. All right, guys. I'm going to get out of here. Voitech says thanks for the loads of great information. My pleasure, Voitech. All my mods, thank you for hanging out with me today. Dougal, again, super happy for you, my friend. I'm going to have a toast to you tonight, Dougal. Awesome, awesome news. Miss Jungles, tell Jungly not to uh, get lost in the hind on DCS when it comes out tonight. Sponsors, thank you so much. All the Super Chats, Vikas, uh, Sergey, everyone else donating to the channel. I appreciate it so much. Until next time, guys, I hope you stay safe, stay healthy. I'm V1. See ya!